Agora TV. The world is thinking. Well, the question to be asked is, why bother? I mean, isn't this obvious? Why do you have to go through the process of economic evaluation of nature? Well, let me try and address that to you, and then also try and explain how it is to be done, because nature is something wondrous. It is our only home. It's worth infinity. We've just established that. Uh, why do you need to put value to the ecosystem services that you get from it? And how do you do this? So in simple terms, yes, it's wondrous, and it's, if you like, envisioned as a three-dimensional colorful ball. Uh, my colleagues call this the discosphere. I'll figure out why they say that. But the problem is this, that you're trying to measure something that is multidimensional in an axis, which is a single dimensional axis, is essentially the dollar axis, if you like, the economic value. And if you don't, then there'll be other things, there'll be other uses of land which are measured in economic value terms, and it will result in trade-off choices, which means that nature would be destroyed, while nature would be replaced by built areas, by, by agriculture, by just human ingress into, into areas which are natural. The thing is, in order to balance that, that equation, in order to sort of balance that trade-off that is happening, you have one end of the scale which has something that's measurable, tangible, like a factory or, or a piece of agricultural land converting land into crop value. And on the other, you have this mystical stuff which you don't put a value to. To balance that, you need to measure nature's services into society. And then when you do that and actually present two sides of the coin, your choice can be quite different. I want to give a small example of this, small because it is a locational, very specific example. This comes from South Thailand. This is about a shrimp farm which arose from a mangrove. And in fact, this applies to a particular area in South Thailand. So economically, the logic was very clear. Shrimp farms worth $9,600 per hectare. And if you leave the forest as it is, the mangrove forest, then that's only providing you something like $600 per hectare based on the fuel wood that is extracted from there by the local community. Economic choice, very obvious. Convert the mangrove to a shrimp farm. But hang on. If you also look at the subsidies that the local government, the Thailand government, provides to the shrimp farm, well, that's $8,000. So if you subtract that, we are talking about not a, such a huge comparison, $1,200 versus $600. But hang on, that's not the end of the story. Because having the mangrove there means that you actually have a massive store of protection from storms and cyclones as they get more frequent, especially with climate change. And not only that, but as a result of the shrimp farm, typically in, in three to five years, you end up having uh, to just reconstruct the whole area because salination and the de deposition of chemicals has basically destroyed that land. So you need to redo the whole area. That costs money. It costs about $10,000. And the value, you can work it out, of the, the mangrove protecting the area that you've, uh, that you've got along the coastline in terms of local communities, their housing, and their livelihoods. That can be measured in terms of areas which had mangroves and those which didn't, how much cyclonic damage they suffered versus the others. And that works out to something like $12,000. Now look at the trade-off choice. And this is the whole point, that if you look at public wealth and include that in your trade-off decisions, you get to a completely different answer than if you simply looked at private profits and worked your your trade-off choice on that basis. In fact, you get the opposite answer. You get conversion as the right economic choice and not, sorry, you get conservation as the right economic choice and not con conversion. So is this just an isolated example from some small community area on the southern coast of Thailand? No. A calculation, a much bigger calculation like this has been done by a group in the UK, a research group called True Cost, and their numbers were quite staggering they worked out that the so-called externalities, in other words, the cost to society of normal business by corporations with normal people like you and me, us buying things like cars, uh, petrol, and them selling it, and us driving it around and creating a carbon externality, or us buying fresh water for too cheap compared to where it comes from and creating, if you like, a negative fresh water externality. All of these added up, and pollution and so on. All of these added up, according to them, are something like $2.25 trillion. That's a huge number, fine, but it's also, interestingly enough, a third, almost a third of the profits of those 3,000 corporations. And you can imagine that this is 3,000 corporations, so there will be some corporations where their externalities, which means their cost to society of doing normal business, are actually higher than the profits that they generate. Now, is that a good business model? Have a corporation, license it, 
set it to work, and guess what? At the end of a few years, it's destroyed a lot more value than it's created. Hmm. Can you keep doing that? No. And that's really the challenge. And that's the challenge that corporations have to address, and we as society have to address with them.